Welcome to the Leaders Room. I'm Ripa Rashid of ICLIF Leadership and Governance Center. I'm delighted today to welcome to the studio Thansri A.K. Nathan, Executive Chairman and Group MD of the Eversendai Corporation. Eversendai is the company behind some of the world's most iconic buildings, including the Petronas Towers here in Kuala Lumpur and the Burj Al Khalifa in Dubai, the world's tallest building. Tansri, I'd like yes. to kick off today's conversation uh, invoking a term you've been called by the press here, man of steel. Man of steel conjures up such powerful attributes, strength, invincibility, superhuman powers. <laughs> what have been the driving forces uh, that have gotten, to, gotten you to where you are today, uh, to being the man of steel? When I was young, I always had the aspiration and the burning desire to be successful in life. The reason is because of the hardship what I went through in the course of my father meeting with an accident and the family lost the, uh, the earning power. I really learned a lot. And the one which really taught me to develop myself and to excel is while I was in India and I studied in India for a few years. India, looking at the environment, the poor, poor people, taught me a lot. It made me to become a better person. Subsequently, when I came back from India to KL, and with not much of uh, education background because I dropped off. I did not continue with my studies even though I had an aspiration to be a graduate, which did not happen. But the thought of becoming an entrepreneur was always burning within me. And in order to be an entrepreneur at that time, I told myself, I want to become a printing company, I want to establish a printing company. So while I was studying in India, I went and enrolled myself to learn the trade. And they paid me three rupees a day at that time. It's just basically to give me some pocket money. And I learned, and eventually when I came to Malaysia, I worked as a printer. So in the course of meeting up, in the course of working, then I meet up salesmen who used to come and sell papers and printing ink. And in the course of conversation, they always tell me, you speak well. Why are you working, wearing all these dirty clothes? Why can't you become a salesman? And I was not happy working there. I was there for about six months. And I told myself, why don't I change the field? And during the course of visiting my sister, and the insurance agent or manager, the insurance manager, who visited my brother-in-law and was having a chat, then he told me, why don't I become an insurance agent? So I said, why not? So I went and enrolled myself. And at that time, I was very shy. I don't have the confidence to go and meet and talk to people. And then and enrolling myself to become an insurance agent. I attended a lot of uh, motivational courses. And I was introduced to this book, The Law of Success, written by Napoleon Hill. At that time, I realized, or in the course of moving into the insurance field itself, I realized that I need to develop myself. I need to upgrade. I need to build up the stronger character. And I came to my own self-realization. So I asked myself, who am I? What am I? what kind of strength, what kind of weakness I have. And I realized that there are certain weakness which I must convert into strength. And when I was introduced to this book, I used to wake up every day by 5.30 in the morning, and I used to sit and read this book every day without fail. And whatever I read, I will always put into practice. And one of the quote in the book was, whatever your mind can conceive, you can achieve. 
So I told myself, that means if I can conceive in my mind, I can achieve it. Obviously, I have to work hard towards achieving it. At the time, I was driving a motorbike and I wanted to buy a car. And Mitsubishi Garland was a very popular car at that time in the 80s. So I went to the showroom, picked up a poster, pasted in front of, the, uh, on the wall in front of the desk where I used to read. I read the book, I will look at the poster. Mind you, 10 months time, I bought the car. So I believe that what's written there, if I practice it, I can make it happen. So there are almost about some 30 to some 35 character building what's written there. I read every subject and I practice every one of it to develop my character, to strengthen myself, to able to venture out, to excel, to attain success. So if you were to ask me what is the biggest uh, thing which is within me, I'm a go-getter. I don't give up. I'm a fighter. So that's, that's an interesting point because one of the things we um, discuss a great deal in our thinking on leadership is the role of perseverance. Yes. The difference uh, between leaders and non-leaders being that non-leaders give up and leaders persevere, surmount, and succeed. And it requires an incredible amount of energy uh, to tap into, to achieve. So, you know, 30 plus years later, here you are still dreaming, visioning, not the next Mitsubishi, but the next <laughs> empire. So tell us, what is it that keeps energizing you? I'm very passionate about my job. One which really inspires, motivates, and even pushes me to achieve much more greater is my employees. I am motivated all because I have to take care. I have to provide the job. Because in the construction field, you got to keep on going for looking for project. It, it's not like you get one job and it's there forever. It lasts, most projects last say two to two and a half years or maximum three. That means you have to keep on hunting for work. And the virtue of me hunting and looking for new job kept on increasing the number of projects and the number of people. And the more the number of people they come on board, again, commitment to take care of them. That's how it progressively have elevated the company and made the company where it is today. So I'm always inspired by my people. And the other aspect, what it really pushes me hard is my commitment. And I always want to deliver what I've promised. I'm an offspring of the Malaysia Lucas policy way back in the 80s. Tell us more about that. And while working with the Japanese, there is three philosophies which I learned, which I have engraved in my work ethics, is not to compromise on safety, quality of workmanship, on-time delivery. Last 30 years, I've never delayed a single job. All the jobs are on time most of the time ahead of time. And because I want to keep up to my commitment and not to fail, from the inception of the company, I always have repeatedly have spoken to my staff at every meeting about safety, quality, on-time delivery. So it's because I keep on telling them, reminding them, it also gets engraved in their mind. And today, my staff, most of them, are very much into it today. One of the aspects which I look at in my business, which I always emphasize to my staff very strongly, is plan, action, and check. You got to plan in order to achieve whatever one wants to, wants one, one what has set to achieve. And once, once is plan, an action is very much needed. You can plan, you can take action, but if you don't check on the plan and the action, 
one would not know whether has it been achieved, has it been materialized, or with there issues, problems. So I always keep telling to my people that you got to do that in a circle where you plan, action, and check, and you got to keep on doing that. And that has really paid off in a big way. I mean, it's very interesting you say that in a lot of um, management, the emphasis on the checking and the feedback yes. is not as strong. And, and you know, that, that's a really interesting piece. You know, business is full of all kinds of tough decisions. Oh, yes. Tell us a little bit about a tough decision you've had to make in the course of your career. There are probably many, but pick <laughs> one um, and, and what the impact of that tough decision was. In my life, every decision has been tough, but I'm a risk taker, but I on a calculated risk. One of my toughest decisions was I was comfortable doing business in Malaysia, in Singapore. There came a phone call asking me to come and execute the Burj Al Arab Hotel, the seven star hotel which is built on a man-made island. Co phone call came almost a dozen times and I was reluctant. And I was thinking, why should I go and work in a country, it's desert, Arabs, don't know what is the uh, work life going to be, what kind of risk is going to be. It was really very tough. Then finally, just to get off the gentleman who was on my back, mm -hmm. I told him, send me over the drawing of the project. So they sent. Now I'm a person, anything which is highly complex, very difficult to build, tickles me. It always inspires me to go and achieve it. That structure is one of the most highly complex, very difficult structure, potentially dangerous to construct. That inspired me. Immediately I booked the flight, seven hours journey. And at the time I always travel only in economy, so I was able to, flight was not full, spread the drawing. By the time I landed in Dubai, I had an idea how to build the structure. They, the main contractor had the project, but they needed to convince the consultant and the client, how are they going to build the structure? And there goes the Malaysian to give them an idea how to build the world's highly complex structure there. So I had an idea, presented to them the methodology step by step, I'm going to build it. They were so impressed. They eventually came back, did a detailed method of statement, did another presentation, and convinced the client and the, consult and the consultant. And we got the job on a negotiated basis. That was in 1996. And that was the key start of Eversendai in the Middle East. The rest and is I, history. History. And I wrote the construction boom after that. Fabulous. And now you can um, list the tallest building in the world. Oh, yes. Subsequently went on to Bull, the Emirates Towers, the uh, Dragon Mart, the uh, Kingdom Center in uh, Saudi Arabia, the um, Khalifa Stadium, Nakilat Shipyard, the NDIA, that means the new Doha International Airport, Terminal One, sorry, the Phase One, Phase Two, Phase Three. Subsequently, the Bruj Khalifa, the world's yes. tallest building. The last 280 meters of the structure, it's all in steel, which is built by us. And today we are one of the highly sought after structural steel contractor in that part of the world. And whichever country we have ventured, it's all by invitation. Never have gone knocking on anybody's doors in any particular country to win a job. It's all through word of mouth, get invited and always been uh, able to win a job and subsequently establish our base, uh, and we have grown. While I was in Singapore, I have uh, actually to work in Hong Kong, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia. Then we moved on to Middle East with the Dubai as the base. We have done work. We have executed work in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, and in Abu Dhabi, Sharjah. We have uh, five fabrication factories, Dubai and in Sharjah, both are in UAE and in Qatar. 
in Doha and in Rawang in a, near about some 40 minutes from KL city. And now the fifth one is in uh, Trichy in India. In total, we have a capacity of 150,000 ton and we can be classified as one of the largest structural steel contractor in the world. And now we have moved into petrochemical plant onshore and offshore and offshore especially to build up, to build uh, top sites and model construction, onshore more towards the petrochemical plant construction. And we're also move, moving into executing composite structures, a combination of structural steel and concrete where we go in with design. So we the last two years we've been hitting the one billion turnover and my target within by the year 2017 to hit the two billion and I wouldn't be surprised if I achieve it earlier than the 2017. Nor would I for that matter <laughs> at this point. Very impressive indeed. I want to step back a little bit and ask you about, um, you know, we talked earlier about your days as an insurance salesman. How did, he get, how did you get your first break in the construction industry? I know there's a bit of a story with <laughs> Nippon Steel and um, a but certain Mr. Uh, Tameki, Tameshi Yamaki. Tameshi Yamaki. No, construction came to me by chance. And I was not in the construction field, I was selling insurance. And it came by chance and I was invited to execute some temporary structural steel work for the Diabumi project way back in 1982. And I met Mr. Tameshi Yamaki in 1983. And that time Malaysia was building the Proton Saga factory, that means the first Malaysian car plant. And he was stationed in Ipoh, where they were doing the fabrication, and they were looking for an erection contractor, I mean a contractor to install the structural steel. And I heard about the project and I went to meet up with him. So when I first met him, and he was interviewing, and he was asking a lot of questions, but he was looking very strongly into my eyes. And I looked into his eyes and I answered whatever question he asked. About 10 days later, he came to my office, gave me a contract and I was shocked because he doesn't know me well and he has given me a sizable contract and gave me a very short notice and I went and uh, mobilized and execu started executing the work. After about two, three months, he was going to Japan for a business visit. And at the time, Subang Airport, he, when he went to check in, I also went along to send him off. And after he checking in, I asked him whether would he be free to have a drink. He said, fine. Now, one of the things which is bugging me is that, why did he give me this project? On what basis? He doesn't know me. So I asked him, Mr. Yamaki, why did you give me this project? On what basis? said to me, Nathan, when you came to my office and as I was meeting and talking to you and I was looking into your eyes, your eyes did not run. That means I can trust you. So just by looking into my eyes, he developed the trust within me and he gave me the contract. He only gave me that job opportunity. Rest of it, I capitalized on the relationship I delivered whatever commitments I made, and from one project led to another project. He is a very strict person. He doesn't give anything beyond that. But for me, it's all about an opportunity. I capitalized on the opportunity, and I made it work for me the way it should be in order to excel and progress and achieve whatever I want to achieve. I had my own share of ups and downs. When I look back, yes, I could have avoided some mistakes, but I always look into all the positive side, what has brought success to me and made me where I, where I am at today. So now when you look to develop the next generation of leaders at Ever Sendai, mm. what do you do? Do you look in their eyes? What, do you, what are the attributes you're looking for? See, qualification is one aspect, uh, but I always, look at a person, whether he or she willing to listen, willing to learn, willing to work hard. 
as long as a person is willing to listen, willing to learn, work together as a team and uh, to work hard, it's easy to teach a person who's willing to listen. So that's the basic things when I look at a person. Obviously, I look at the eyes, no doubt about it, uh, because a person who's sincere and genuine would not be, will, will only be able to look into your eyes, but not, they will not be able to run away. Really. So. We all need to apply that eye, eye test. Yes. Eye contact. Eye contact is one. Eye contact is one aspect. But the most important is a person whether they're willing to listen or not. If a person is willing, you can always... I'm a, I'm a great believer in sharing, uh, teaching, educating, motivating. I can always push a person to, uh, to move forward to, to succeed. Uh, but then... If a person is not willing to listen, it's, you can't do anything with it, such kind of attitude. So I, I, I look into this kind of basic uh, attitude and character within a person. I'm a strong believer in character building. So tell us a little more about that, about character building, and how, how do you do that with, with your next generation? One of the most difficult, one, a pers uh, what one person go through is when you've fallen down, to pull up, to get up, and to move forward. That's very difficult. But I was able to do that, is because one, I'm very, very, I have a lot of perseverance within me. I'm very persistent. I'm very, very persistent with it. Talking about persistent, Petronas Tower was about to be awarded, and I was living in Singapore at that time. And at that time, I was building a 66-story building in Singapore. It's a combination of concrete and steel, and that's a similar structural element what they're using on the Petronas Towers. So I told myself, I have the experience, and I want to build it. I already set my mind. Tower 1 was given to a Japanese company. By virtue of my exposure in the Japanese company, I was confident I'll be able to win it. I lost it. I was demoralized for two days, thinking that, my God, I've lost the opportunity to build the tallest building in the world. Then I realized, hey, there is another tower. So I went and approached. The second tower, that's Tower 2, is, was awarded to a Korean company, Samsung. When I went and approached them, they said, sorry, we already made up our mind whom to, uh, whom to work with no chance. So I was disappointed. But then I found out that they have not awarded the job yet. So I didn't give up because my mind already said that I must win this job. I went back again and again and again. I would have visited the office not less than about a dozen times. And there were times they have been abusive. They even told me off that why am I wasting their time? But I never gave up. One of the days when I went, went in to, uh, to visit them, they invited me to have coffee. I was very surprised to say, wow, not bad. So then they started interviewing, asking me questions about what I was doing and all. Now at the time I was doing the, as I told them, the Republic Plaza in Singapore, which is a 66 story building then, at the time we were already doing the, executing the KL Tower, the head and the mass. So I told the Korean, uh, guys, why don't you make a visit and see what we are doing? It's nothing like seeing, because you don't know my, my track record. He said, okay. So at the time I was living in Singapore, so we fixed a date, and then from Singapore, I drove all the way, picked up these three Korean gentlemen, and drove all the way to Singapore. They, those days, from KL to Ramang is the highway. After that, you have this windy road takes about some five and a half hours or to reach Singapore. I started here and I did not stop anywhere. I only stopped at Singapore. I had them in the car. I was able to penetrate into them, develop a relationship. And by the time we reached Singapore, we were friends. The next day I took them to the site showed them what I was doing. They were amazed. Mind you, they went there only to investigate. They landed up in my office after the visit in the site, and I was typing the MOU, and we signed off. 
Very impressive. So I never gave up with it. It's because mm. I set my mind, I must win the job. It's because I didn't give up and I was so persistent, I was able to win the contract. With it. And Petronas, that project, has brought me many other projects. With it. Because one good project brings another good project. With it. Fascinating. And, and you were, you know, you literally took them for a ride. <laughs> Relationship building. <laughs> well, no, I don't take people for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> no, you took them on a very constructive uh, yes. ride. Mm. Well, I was going to say, um, you know, that I'm, I'm really curious as to your bridging mm -hmm. that cultural divide with the Koreans as mm -hmm. well, getting to know them, etc. So I know that Ever Sendai is planning to expand. Um, to a number of new countries mm. to hit that $2 billion mark in the next couple of years. As a Malaysian, a very successful Malaysian entrepreneur, what do you think have been the keys to success in this global arena? Relationship. I maintain a very healthy relationship with my client, my staff, and the people who I work with. I'm a strong believer in relationship and to always live up to my commitments to whomever I'm making. Those are the basic which I've used in order to expand and develop and grow the business. Clients, whoever award a job to us, they do it based on trust because they believe in me. Because most of the clients in the early days, they will ask me, can you make a commitment that you'll deliver it? They all just want, they don't look at what the contract I'm signing is only from my word. If I say I'll get it done, mean that's it. They will just go ahead and they know I will get it done. I will stand there, even if I have to work 24 hours, I'll be there to make sure I'll push, I will get the job done. And end of the day, clients want a project to be completed without comp the compromising on the safety and the quality. So, by virtue of we completing all the projects on time, we have built up a very strong reputation. Today, Evisandai reputation is something where it's riding so high and we become a sought after organization. Because they know we will deliver if a job is entrusted. And that's the way we expand and grown the business. So, I always attribute relationship, commitment, without compromising. And obviously all goes with the people. I've been blessed with excellent people, people who are dedicated, loyal, hardworking. I've got a very strong battalion. If I move, they move with me. Fantastic people I have. They've been the oldest employee I have is about 29 years. Second is about 25 plus. And the rest of them, all the 21, 20, 15, 10. I got a lot, a huge number of long serving employees. I took care of them, I educate them, I nature them, I build them up. People have become, who have come and joined the company as just engineers. Today they are directors of the company and they're all earning well. I met a lot of people uh, successful in their own rights. And so I command the loyalty. And without the people, I don't think so I'll be where I am today too. Because I'm a strong believer there is no way I can build all by myself. I need team of people. And team of people is one aspect, but whether do I have dedicated, committed, loyal, hard-working people with it. and people who can work smartly. A lot of new people have come on board because the company has grown, expanded, and as we, as I said to you that we are going to convert the company to two billion, we need much more big number of people. And uh, by God's grace and my uh, vision and my approach and the way I go about dealing with people, I've been able to bring in some good people and uh, human capital is something nowadays is becoming difficult, especially good people. Huh? People are abundant, but good people. 
I always believe the more effort we put in, we can get the people. So I'm moving forward. Well, clearly your uh, inspiration to many of your employees. Um, that is. So let's turn the tables. When you think of someone who you've admi you have admired, mm -hmm. who you see as a source of inspiration, who, who's that person been in your life? Myself. I've, no one has inspired me. I inspire myself. I motivate myself. I, even if I were to do wrong, I penalize myself. It's all about me. No one person really came and advised me, guided me, um, did not show me the direction. It is just that I had the burning desire, I moved forward, and along with it, I was given an opportunity, and I grabbed the opportunity, made good use of it, and developed and grew. And along the way, I learned by realizing my own shortfalls, mistakes, and upgraded myself as I progressed in my life. Today, I, I share a lot of what I know to people at large. I conduct talks, I share, educate to whoever wants to capitalize on what I'm sharing. So, I like to give. You know, on that note, I want to ask one closing question. Yep. Uh, when you think of the legacy, both personal and professional, you want to leave behind you, what, want, what would you want your legacy to look like? Way back in 1980, early 84, while I was having a chat with uh, Mr. Yamaki, I asked him where from Japan he comes from. He said, Sendai. I like the sound Sendai. I asked him, what's the meaning of Sendai? He said, thousands of generation. I made it ever thousands of generation. That's how ever since I was formed, was born way back in 1984. Sendai is a city northeast of uh, Tokyo, a city which was hit by a tsunami a few years ago. With the name, with the brand, with the reputation, we say generation, I want Ebersendai to go on forever. We have 11,000 employees on the payroll. When you multiply by four to a family, it's 44,000 people. I am committed and I want to make sure this 44,000 plus the many, many more who is going to come and join this company to have their livelihood protected and they have a job, they look at towards the future. And I even have told my staff, I would prefer even their children to come and work for Ever Sendai if they're interested and if they qualify. So what I'm looking at, it's all about future, the way how the company should move forward how the company must move forward without compromising on basic principles is safety, quality, on-time completion. And I am very, very sure people whom I'm going to entrust the company towards the future, they will follow and they will uphold because I'm blessed with some great people. Thank you for watching today's edition of The Leaders Room. This is Ripa Rashid of the Icliff Center for Leadership and Governance signing off until next time.